Hey everybody, it's Mr. Gallegos. This video is to accompany the reading that you should have done from the American Yap called The Introduction and the Prelude to War. And this is all about World War I. So, let's start. In this video, here's what I'm going to cover. Here are my objectives for you. Number one, you should be able to understand the causes of World War I in Europe after you watch. And number two, you should be able to explain why the U.S. entered the Great War. In the introduction, the authors talked about why World War I is called the Great War. So it's a huge war that involves a lot of countries. It's the first major world war in the world's history. The United States does not enter the war until 1917, even though the war had been going on since 1914. The introduction also talks about how the United States showed its military power and its economic power. And the introduction also talks about the local U.S. problems that appeared after the war. So in other words, how the war helped domestic issues appear in the United States. And finally, the introduction talks about the new foreign problems that the United States was going to have after World War I. So, in the section Prelude to War, there's two parts. Number one is the part about how the war begins in Europe. And the second part of the section is how the United States gets involved in the war. So let's get into it. So here's what you should have read. I hope this stuff sounds familiar to you as you watch. First of all, peace in Europe is being threatened by this new leader named Wilhelm II of Germany. And the reason that peace in Europe is threatened is because he's a nationalist and he's also a militarist. So he grows up Germany's navy and it also helps Germany assert its colonial power around the world. In other words, it makes Germany into an empire. Now, he also is responsible for a wave of nationalism along Germany. So a lot of Germans are feeling very kind of proud and confident of their country. And this is honestly starting to threaten other European countries. So some other European countries actually form alliances against the Germans. So in 1914, this is a map of how Europe looked before the war. So here's what's going on. First of all, you have this pinkish color, the central powers, and then you have this greenish color, which are the allied powers. So let me start talking about the triple entente or the allied powers first. So the allied powers consist of countries like Russia, Great Britain, and France. And they had been allied since 1892 against the Germans, the Austro-Hungarians, and the Turks. So Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Turkey. They're the ones that formed the other alliance. So these two competing alliances are what set the stage for World War I and this possible conflict that is going to last from 1914 all the way to 1918. And that's what we call the Great War. So this whole section is also discussing a famous murder, a famous assassination. And it's perpetrated by this guy named Pavrilo Principe. Pavrilo murders, murdered, I'm sorry, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, which were at that time the leaders of a country called Austria-Hungary. And since they were the heirs to the throne, they were going to be the new leaders of Austria-Hungary. Uh, Gavrilo Princips kind of precipitated or started a chain reaction of events that was going to start World War I. And the reason that he assassinated these people is pretty significant. In, in his mind, they were going to conquer his country of Serbia and him being a nationalist, he didn't want this to happen. And so he go, goes ahead with his plan and he causes basically the start of the Great War. So at this moment, you should pause the video and reflect on this question. Why did the Great War begin in Europe by 1914? So hopefully you reflected about this, you paused the video, and you thought about your answer. So here's some clues to give you some more content for your answer. Remember this acronym, MANIA. And MANIA caused the Great War. And here's how we remember this. M stands for militarism and how it's growing in Germany at the time under the rulership of Wilhelm II. Alliances, as they confront each other in Europe, they cause this tension that's building up and that they're going to explode against each other. 
the nationalism which is spreading through Germany and it's causing Germans to become very kind of proud of the fact that they're German and they don't want other countries interfering with their plans. Imperialism, which is one of the goals of Germany, to conquer new land and to gain natural resources and become kind of a world power. And of course, the assassination of Austria-Hungary's heirs, the, the Franz Ferdinand, uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife. So in this last section of the video, I'm going to discuss the last part of the reading, Prelude to War. In this section, the authors talked about why the United States got involved in the Great War. So let's get into it. First of all, the United States rarely intervened in any European problems. In fact, the only thing that the United States was doing at the time with Europe was trading with Europeans. And so this trade helped the United States a lot. In fact, Americans were trading, but they did favor staying out of the war. This was a suggestion all the way back from President George Washington as he's leaving office uh, in the late 1780s. And in fact, continuing with this theme of isolation, the United States was actually not really prepared to be diplomatic with other nations at the time. In fact, it was kind of running its own imperial project on the side over here with the Philippines and Cuba. And America's military was small, and it was not really equipped to deal with a war of this size. So Americans generally favored staying out of the war. Even though the United States did have a modern navy, and even though we were sort of running our own empire over here in the Pacific Ocean... A lot of Americans did not want to enter the war, and they kind of favored the fact that we were going to stay out of it. So, as America's military begins to grow, it's growing with the help of the U.S. government. Because the government passes two very important pieces of legislation, two laws that helped the American military grow. So the first one is the Davis Act of 1906, and the second one is the National Defense Act of 1916. Together, these two complete this project the national guard program which is a very important program for the united states because now it gives the u.s the ability to have soldiers and sailors ready to go in case of a war now at the time the united states was trying to stay out of european problems but it was very involved in a in a latin american problem with mexico see mexico was running its own problems here mexico had a revolution going on and the united states had supported the revolution to a certain extent but one thing I was trying to do is to try out these new technologies that, that the United States was building. And it was using Mexico's revolution as practice for using these new technologies. So I'm talking about things like airplanes, tanks, uh, general purpose vehicles, machine guns, all these cool new technologies that the United States hadn't had a chance to use. It started to practice using them in the Mexican revolution. So here's what, what happens. After the Mexicans kind of declare their revolution, their, their, they want to undo the rulership of, a, of an old guy named Porfirio Diaz, and the United States sort of helps them. And from about April to November of 1914, the American Marines blockaded Mexico because the Germans, the British, and the French had been selling arms to one of the factions of the revolution. And so the United States didn't like this faction of the revolution, and it was blockading them so they wouldn't receive weapons from these Europeans. And so the other thing that started happening here is that after... Some Mexicans got upset. They started to invade parts of the United States. And one guy that invaded a North American town was Pancho Villa. And he invaded a North American town named Columbus, New Mexico. And when he invaded, the United States retaliated by sending the army into Mexico. 100,000 American soldiers under the leadership of this guy named John Blackchap Pershing. And this guy pursued Pancho Villa all around northern Mexico over the state of Chihuahua. And he never caught him. But he got to try out all these new cool technologies, like airplanes, for example. And even though they failed and they weren't very reliable, he at least got to try them before they went to war in Europe. Now, the Great War had broken out since 1914, but President Wilson, this guy right here, had tried to keep us out of the war. In fact, he declared neutrality. But Germany was trying everything it could. And in 1917, in January... The German Foreign Office wrote this telegram to Mexico, and it was hoping to get the Mexicans to cooperate with Germany. And it promised the Mexicans that if they beat America together, that Germany was going to return Mexico all of the land that it had lost during the U.S. war with Mexico back in 1846 to 1848. But before this, this telegram would make it to Mexico, the Americans and the British intercepted it, and they told Germany, you know what, Germany, you're really pushing it here. You're trying to get us involved in this war. The last thing that kind of 
precipitated the U.S. to get in the war is this. The Germans were using these new submarines. They called them U-boats. And they were using them against Britain and France. But since America was not trying to get involved in the war, America stayed out and it didn't send any aid to Britain and France for a while. The problem was that Americans were on board of this ship right here, which was known as the RMS Lusitania. And in May of 1915, the German U-boats sunk this ship. And unfortunately, along with all the other passengers it had, over 100 Americans were on board. And because these Americans died, this pushed the U.S. to say, okay, this is it. We're going to enter the war. The United States entered the war, and it entered the war with one key advantage. And that was that it was the top global industrial power. It was producing about a third of the world's manufactured goods by 1914. So it was a very strong economy, and it was ready to go to war. So here's where you should pause and reflect again. Pause the video and think about the answer you have to this question. Why did the U.S. enter the Great War in 1917? So go ahead, pause the video. So here's what you should know as far as the answer to that question. Azul. Azul is the Spanish word for blue. Now, Azul caused the U.S. to enter the Great War. So here's what the acronym stands for. A stands for Alliances with Britain and France. Z stands for the Zimmerman Telegram from Germany to Mexico. U stands for Unrestricted Submarine Warfare, which was what the Germans were doing by 1917. And then finally, the L, the Lusitania, which was sunk by the Germans and had over 100 Americans on board. And this is the reason why the United States entered the Great War. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you learned something. And uh, keep checking here for more of these videos. Okay, bye-bye.